Electricast. There's a change happening in the way we live, the way we work, the way we spend our money and make our decisions. We are evolving to be more conscious in our actions in a way that serves the world and makes it a better place. Welcome to The Ethical Evolution. The Ethical Evolution podcast is brought to you by Ethical Change Agency. I'm Bindi, I'm the founder, and my mission is to help ethical entrepreneurs and holistic healers to find their voice through spiritual coaching and podcasting. I'm honoured to bring you the stories of those who create change through healing, kindness, innovation, purpose, and spirit. Understanding that to create collective change, we need to be the change. It all begins with us. After an excruciatingly painful divorce, Kelly Calabrese got certified as a divorce coach to help and heal others to do the same. As an author, health and lifestyle coach and speaker based in Texas, Kelly helps women go from grief to great with her intentionally fabulous coaching. She also has released the book Success Habits of Super Achievers, sharing 80 stories from world-class coaches, thought leaders, entertainers, speakers, authors, realtors, and more. Kelly is a breath of fresh air who's here to remind us we're already fabulous, we just need to set it free. Welcome, Kelly, to The Ethical Evolution. Thank you for having me, Bindi. I've been looking forward to this. Me too. Now, you're, you're coming to us from the, the big, big, wide span of Texas. Thank you for joining <laughs> us today. Um, now, um, for people who don't know who you are, can you uh, tell us? Absolutely. I empower women to overcome rejection, fear, and grief following divorce so that they can heal and build a powerful bonus life. Wow. That's impressive. That's really impressive. So tell us a bit more about that and and how you do that. Yeah. So I've been in health, fitness, nutrition, wellness, lifestyle as an executive and an entrepreneur for 35 years. And my own personal story, you know, took me from pain to purpose in becoming a divorce coach I really was blindsided after a 24 year marriage when my husband came home and said his commitment to our marriage was zero and he left. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, it, it really floored me. And there was a series of unreasonable events that occurred, including, you know, managing children. And so I went on this healing sabbatical because when a tornado comes in and blows up your life like that and just scatters all the pieces, leaving you with a gaping hole in your heart, you're going to do something to get better. And I wanted to do something healthy. So I, on my own journey, went to divorce recovery. I went to conferences, retreats, read the books, listened to the sermons, did all the things and finally arrived at a place where I really felt like I had peeled back the layers and was able to get back up again in confidence and in health and felt really led to help other women. When I got divorced, I had about 12 friends getting divorced at the same time. The number one age for divorce is 30. The number two age is 50. So I was in that 50 mark and I just wanted everyone to do something healthy. Mm. And, you know, I, I guess when any relationship ends, um, whether it, whether you're married or not, and it ends in divorce, it can it can really be a life changing event. Uh, to, and it's really what you do with that event. But what happens next, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I had studied personal development for over 30 years when I was going through my divorce, but nothing really prepared me. I mean, all the Tony Robbins and all the, you know, the, the certifications and all the coaching that I had done with people of all walks of life, including friends who had gotten divorced, until I went through it, I didn't really understand. And that was just the turning point that um, made me reevaluate everything in my life, which really started with my identity. I realized my identity was in who I was as a wife and a mom when my kids were about to go off to college and the neighborhood I lived in and, and all those things. So I really needed to hold up the mirror and ask myself, who am I? Yeah. And there's a lot of conditioning that comes, I think, uh, with with the history of marriage and and divorce, um, I mean, just the energy of the word divorce, it, it just sounds yucky, doesn't it? It's just <laughs> one of those things that nobody wants to go through. Um, but it can get really nasty, can't it? 
It can. I mean, divorce means cut off from, mm. separated from. And when you're with someone for a long time, you don't ever really imagine, unless it's unhealthy, abusive. I mean, there are cases where you just, you know, should not be connected. But I really thought we'd sit on the bleachers next to each other. We'd be at birthday parties celebrating for the kids. But it was cut off. I mean, social media, everything. I haven't had communication in years and I, that just kind of added to, cause you're kind of grieving, like this was your best friend. So mm. you, you lost a lot. And, um, in my case, my former husband was re-engaged within a month and remarried and had a whole new family. So that just, you know, kind of triggered the, the grief oh. even more. Um, but everyone's story is different, but the suffering, the, you know, the bitterness, the anger, the sadness, the denial, um, the fear, Everyone experiences that to some degree. That's just part of grief, whether whether it's the the actual death of a spouse or death of a child, loss of a job. I mean, any loss, you're going to, in a healthy way, hopefully, if you do it right, hit all those grief points. But a lot of people get stopped and they get stopped and stuck in one of those places. Mm. And yeah, it's, you know, I, I guess for you, it, it kind of felt like you almost lost part of yourself when, when that was cut off and, and you're like, what do I do now? Yeah. And I was a super achiever before. I mean, I had, you know, owned and operated health clubs and managed corporate fitness centers. I've spoken all over the world and international stages, best-selling author three times over. I've been on all the major network. I wasn't, you know, just sitting incompetent. I was someone who had you know, I was capable. I was running a big household, managing the kids. And this really, I couldn't function. I mean, I, I was not ever a depressed person before, but I was depressed. I mean, mm. I had, I have the paperwork to prove it. You know, I went to a counselor. He's like, Kelly, you're, you're so healthy. You're empathetic. You're sympathetic and all these things, but you're depressed. And it was situational. I'm not n- normally a depressed person, but there were so many things that I didn't know words like situational depression before divorce that divorce really highlighted for me. And, you know, I had friends who had gone through divorce and looking back, I was a terrible friend because I hadn't gone through it. So I, I wasn't equipped. I didn't understand. I didn't know how to help them. It's like if someone says their house burned down, unless your house is burned down, you know, you don't know unless you've had a child die or had an abortion or, you know, whatever. If you haven't gone through it, it's hard to really, really understand the depths of it. Mm. So uh, for, for women in particular, um, like what, what's some of the top tips that you could give to a woman who uh, has found themselves, uh, you know, being served with divorce papers and uh, they're finding themselves in that situation? Yeah, one of the things is you feel this wave of, you know, whatever the first thing is, whether you ask for the divorce or you're getting served with divorce papers, it, it just feels chaotic and you need to get calm first because you don't, even in the military, they always tell you calm down. Like before you make any decisions, before we make any moves here, breathe, get calm, get present. When people start to think about the future, especially women, there's so much fear because there's so much uncertainty about finances and will I be alone and will I be lovable? You know, am I, worthy of another person. I mean, there's so much. So they get into the sphere. And if they spend all their time thinking about the past where they're replaying the injustice and how unfair things were and the dreams that were shattered, they're in constant regret. So if we can get them present and get them breathing. The next thing would be to find something that's good about the current situation. And I know that's hard and there are mm. horrible stories out there. I'm not minimizing terrible things, but to start with some glimmer of hope that you can find something that's good about your current situation to start to build on one little step at a time. And then that becomes a ripple effect that compounds out. So that's one of the first things, just get present, just breathe, just find one good thing. Another thing I like to do is have them do what I call a to don't list. And that is before we start adding these things on, which could be great things like journal and, you know, meditate and let, but what can we cut out? What's not urgent? What's not important? What's not adding to your life? Um, What can you procrastinate on, delegate, put on hold or stop doing that you're doing that's harmful that you're ready to commit to, whether it's you're now drinking a bottle of wine every night or, um, you know, you're, you're on a dating app or, you know, like what, what is adding to the chaos and confusion and victim place that you can stop? Cause when you stop doing a harmful thing or a thing that's not helping, it gives you space to breathe and it opens up 
for allowing for something that's helpful. Mm. And that's that's such great points you make, Kelly, because, you know, when we don't, you know, get present with ourselves and actually breathe, we get stuck in our emotions and then things just run wild and that's when things just go haywire. Um, and I think that sometimes can be hard to do if you're, you're not used to it. Um, and, and also, yeah, just clearing the decks and, and just, you know, sometimes divorce can be a blessing too, can't it? It can be. Yeah. I mean, when you're looking at, wow, what's good about this? There are a lot of good things. I mean, once I got past the, the real pain, I'm like, wow, I don't have to compromise anything. Yeah. Like, I get to make all the decisions, what I eat, where I eat, what time I go to sleep, the temperature of the house. Um, you know, it's a fresh start. You could have a whole new friend group of, you know, whether single friends or you can pick up a hobby. You could be the best you you've ever been. Like you've got opportunity for personal development. If you have children, now you have really quality parenting time versus quantity. When you just have them all the time, you're really intentional about that time, your house may be so filled with peace. Like maybe there was arguing and fighting Mm. and a mess before. Now you're like, oh, I could light my candle. I could take my bath and really become a whole self and I can go out and serve. So there's a lot of great things to being single. Mm. Yes, I I can concur with that one. Um, Now, Kelly, can you tell us about some of the women that you've helped um, through their divorce and the difference that it's made? Yes. So I help women all the way from, they could come in still being married, but they might come in going, oh, I can't stand to be in the room with him. I don't Mm. want to look at his tattoos. I don't want like, we're in separate bedrooms. And if I can help her work on her and not even, you know, consider him, but just let's work on you. I've actually had marriages that reunited and are so strong even now, a couple of years later, they're more in love than they ever were. It's never perfect ever, but wow, she got to work on her things and now their marriage got better. And then the other end of the spectrum is I see women seven years after their divorce and the divorce wasn't a season. It was a cycle and they keep repeating, repeating, uh, repeating. Mm-hmm. It's the same toxic thinking, the same victim mentality, and they'll even date the same guy. He just has a different face, but it's the same, you know, type, the same addict or the same lazy or, or you know, whatever it is, they keep repeating it. So anywhere on the spec from, from thinking about separating to years post-divorce, I work with women throughout and I've had so many success stories. In fact, the very first woman that I work with was from the UK and she recently wrote me, it was over a year ago now, and said that it was myself, Tony Robbins and Brene Brown. She said the three of you wow. were the body, mind, spirit combo of everything that I needed to, you know, just love myself and get the resilience to get back up again. Wow, that's that's a bit of a powerhouse uh, trio there. Well done, My you. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess you know, do you do you also find women who find it challenging getting back into a relationship after divorce? Yes, you know, it's interesting because. I'm a knowledge person. So I wanted to learn and really figure this out, but I was not anxious at all about dating. It was just like, it got taken away from me. I was so focused on just being healthy and whole myself that I had no anxiety Mm. about dating. Plus when you've been in a marriage that long, sometimes you're like, you know what? I don't really want to take care of a man right now. I don't, I'm not in any rush to do that. And I see my married friends and I'm like, yeah, I'm not in a rush, but at some point it won't be enough just being alone. Um, they put people in prison in solitary confinement because it's torture. I mean, we're not designed to be alone and some women will isolate in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. So there's always Mm -hmm. those two ends of the ditch where you don't want to put yourself in total isolation where you'll never look at a man. You you hate man. You're like that. That's not healthy, but at some point you'll get to a place where you're like, okay, I feel good alone, but now I want a little more. I want to start to reopen my heart And it might look like I'm going to write a list of my core values, what's important to me. And then I'm just going to kind of put some feelers out there and let a couple of friends know or just be open because there's an energy you put off. So people will know if you're open to meeting them, you know, someone at the parking lot in the grocery store, you you just have that energy and you can feel that versus, you know, if if I was married, that was just my energy. Like I'm, I'm all business. I'm going to get my groceries. But Mm -hmm. if you're not you're just, you're making connection, you're making conversation. 
and just be open to go out and getting to know people as friends. It doesn't have to get right into romance, but you might know in one date, you know, that's a very nice man as a kind, mature man has a lot of good qualities, but he's just not the one for me for whatever reason. There's no chemistry or he's got young kids and I'm not, you know, I'm done with that season. So I would say you'll know when you know that you want more and to do it in a really healthy way. I have not done online dating. I know people have been successful. People have been frustrated. People have been harmed by online dating. So I like the idea of starting by letting your close friends know who know you, love you, and you trust them (laughs) and to be open to going to parties and, you know, just getting out to events when you can, you know, with this whole pandemic, if you can do that and do it in a place where your interests are. People are meeting at the dog park, There's so many opportunities if you're intentional. Yeah. Dating in a pandemic is challenging. Can I tell you? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, One thing I notice uh, in the coaching that I do with women is um, a lot of them tend to lose their identity and um, they struggle to find space for themselves. Um, And no doubt when recovering from divorce, even if you're not divorced and you're still in a relationship, um, you can lose yourself. Um, is that something that, that you work with as well uh, with women? Absolutely. That's actually chapter one of my eight week program is identity. Cause you mm. have to know who you are. And a lot of times we're beating ourselves up. So we're seeing ourselves as a failure, unworthy, unlovable. If you left the marriage and you broke up your family, you're feeling guilty If you were the one left, you're feeling rejected. So there's kind of a lot of negative things that are going around when you've gone through divorce and women in general, I mean, we're just hard on ourselves, our bodies and we just are. So let's look at what are you telling yourself? And then is that true? Is that who you really are? And then how can you start to catch yourself and reframe that? And let's write some new things down. I am loved. I am full of peace. I am come up with whatever you think you really are and then record those, play them back, read them, put them on your mirror, put them on your steering wheel and start to um, believe that you are this new person, not the one maybe that you've been telling yourself, which isn't true. Or maybe it's the old you, maybe you were an alcoholic, but you're not anymore. Maybe you were a perfectionist or an enabler or whatever, but that's not the new you. I'm not someone who goes through the drive throughs The old me did, the new me doesn't. So whatever it is, look at what's not serving you and how can you come up with something that does, that you replace it and um, write it down, read it, tell friends about it, put it on a vision board until you start to believe it, then you'll become it because your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become what you speak, what you speak then becomes your actions, your actions become your um, habits, the habits, your character and the character, your identity. So it starts with what you believe. So do you believe, you know, I'm fat, I'm poor, I'm ugly, or I'm strong, I'm powerful, I'm healthy. So a lot of the identity just starts with um, those I am statements and, and what you believe about yourself. And then you become what you believe. Mm, and the other side of that coin as well is is, is loving yourself, isn't it? Uh, because um, a lot of women, when they're in a relationship, they're, they're so focused on giving to everybody else that they quite often forget to give to themselves. And, yes. you know, particularly when you've got kids um, and a million other things going on, um, you are last on that priority list. And I think it's really important that you make a space for yourself and time for yourself to actually take care of you. Yes. So self-love is chapter four. (laughs) Oh, geez. I feel like I've read this book intuitively. (laughs) Yeah. And it is, it's so important. And as women, we do, we're the caregivers. So we put ourselves last, but this whole universal principle of giving and receiving, if you're giving, 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 eventually you're going to be empty. You have nothing left to give. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be resentful. And you're not full. And what's inside you when it gets squeezed with the pressures of life is what comes out of you. And if that winds up being exhaustion, bitterness, you know, anger, defensiveness, because that's all that's left because you've served strangers, you've served, you know, people at work, everyone else, and there's nothing left for you. So you have to refill your cup. And the cool part is the receiving, like turn your receiver on 
not only being good to yourself, but let other people be good to you. Like we're so like resistant to that. Why are we so bad at receiving? And when I turned my receiver on, it was amazing. I stopped telling people, no, 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 I, I'll, I'll buy dinner. No, no. I'm like, wait a minute. You're, you're always giving, like, it's okay for someone to buy you dinner or to bring you a book or whatever. Well, it got so amazing that I actually started keeping track. And every night when I journal, I have a section of my journal that's about something I received for the day. And I put a dollar value on it. Mm. I'm like, well, someone bought me soup or someone brought me a book or, you know, whatever it was, I started writing it down and it's been amazing. I mean, it literally is going to total a lot of money at the end of the year that I didn't have to pay for that because I was willing to receive And then you start to love yourself more and care for yourself more when you're willing to receive. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Excuse me. Now, one of the things I love to ask guests, Kelly, um, is what being ethical means to them. And I'm curious to find out from you what it means to you. Yeah, I would say being ethical is an important core value. It's when you're doing the right thing when someone isn't looking. But for me, it's really letting love win. To me, the the highest possible ideal is love. And that's what I go for every day. That is the lens that I look through to make all my decisions in life. And I always want the best possible outcome in every situation until it's a present tense reality. So I'm always contending for love to win And to me, that's the ethical thing to do. We're called to do that. We're called to do right, to be well, to be doers of good things. Mm, Absolutely. And I could not agree more. Now, Kelly, um, tell us just quickly, I know you've been talking about uh, your book, but can you tell us just a little bit more about it and where people can get it? Yes. So my book and my program are two different things. My latest best-selling book is called Success Habits of Super Achievers. And there are over 80 stories in there of ordinary people that something unreasonably difficult happened to that they chose to overcome that thing and not only overcome it, but to do something amazing with it and give back. And so I recommend that people read a chapter a day because if you just wake up, it's a couple of pages and you read someone's story, like, wow, if they did that, I could get through my day. I can't even, you know, compare what I have to that. Or you'll, you'll just read some story that will give you hope. And so that's what the book is about. If they go to my website, kellycalabrese.com, it's Kelly with an I. Um, They can get a free electronic copy there or they can get it on Amazon, Success Habits of Super Achievers, so they can download it right now. And then my program is called Intentionally Fabulous, and that is about helping women redefine their lives post-divorce to go from grief to great, and that's at intentionallyfabulous.com. And we could all use a little bit of fabulous right now, Kelly, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. And that book, oh, my gosh, um, there was a reason why you and I stumbled upon each other. And um, just just that alone, my gosh, you can make a podcast out of that book. Seriously. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you can contact the co-authors in there and invite them to be on your show. Most of them are some of my personal and best friends and amazing stories in there. Mm. Thanks for that tip. Um, Now, I got the uh, final big question for you, Kelly. Uh, What's the change you'd like to see in the world and how can we bring it to life? I would love for people to be more resilient. I would love for them just to know that life is full of struggle and rejection. It's just normal. It's just part of life. It builds our strength. It builds our resilience. But don't, don't be a victim. Get back up get back up, take a small step, let a small step become two small steps. Just keep climbing. It is worth it. That's where you get stronger. And then when you get to the top of that mountain, there's not a lot of people up there, but it is a beautiful view and it is so worth it. So don't stay down. Nothing is too far gone. Nothing is too terrible. Um, Just believe truth, believe light, believe life, and just keep getting back up, get support, um, get counseling, surround yourself with friends, and just go out there and be your best self because there's a good plan and a good purpose on your life. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe you just said that because um, it almost is exactly the same thing I said in my very first podcast I ever did um, where uh, I talked about, you know, my story. Uh, and I was I sat there and I thought to myself, why why are all these things happening to me? Like what what's what's the lesson here? 
And um, I just sat and I listened and what came back was um, if without the fall you don't um, understand the growth in getting back up again. So just like a trampoline, you can't get up until you get down. Uh, so what you just said there is exactly that same thing. So, um, you know, whilst we do fall, it's getting back up again that makes it all worthwhile. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Kelly, I can't thank you enough for being a part of the Ethical Evolution. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm happy to do it. And thanks for bringing the show to the world. The world needs it. Thanks for listening to the Ethical Evolution podcast. If you're ready to be the change and would love to work with me on finding your voice through spiritual coaching or creating your own podcast with impact, visit ethicalchangeagency.com. Welcome, explorers of the human experience. This is Let's Talk Soul, and I'm your host, Claudia Monticelli. We're not afraid of the great mysteries of existence here. Soul versus consciousness, we're on it. Spirituality versus science, we've got that covered too. Join us in navigating these profound topics with wisdom, curiosity, and a dash of audacity. Whether you're a spiritual veteran or just starting your journey, Let's Talk Soul is your passport to the unknown. Let's Talk Soul, diving into the depths of the human spirit. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. Miles, are you ready to record our promo for season two of the Wanna Bet podcast? David, have you ever seen a grown man naked? Miles, we're not here to quote lines from Airplane. We're here to tell people that season two starts August 18th. But I like Airplane. I know you do, but Wanna Bet is a sports betting podcast. Each week we bet $1,000 on the NFL teams and games that we love. Well, that sounds like fun. It is fun. And last year you picked over 60% of your games correctly. How'd you do? We're not talking about that. We are telling people that they can find us every Friday. So no more movie quotes. Roger, Roger. Electric acid.